Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to Office Hours today. Uh, as usual, we'll start with a brief overview of some recent updates uh, in the protocol, and then we'll open up the stage for questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to either post them in the text chat or raise your hand, and we'll get you up on stage later. Let's see. Um, so a uh, quick note about um, the current quoted APYs. Um, so you may have noticed it's diverging somewhat from the target um, that we established with the KIP-14. Um, this is kind of expected. Basically, um, the percent of state clima has gone up uh, by a few percentage points. And uh, there has also been slightly shorter block times on Polygon. So those two effects together have led to an APY of closer to about 900% as opposed to the target of 1,000%. Uh, so it's right now at 888, which is like just barely outside of the 10% range um, that we use to determine whether we need to make an adjustment. So if it stays below 900% APY for about a week or so, um, the policy team does have the power from KIP9 to adjust. So um, we'll be monitoring that closely. And um, if the you know conditions remain the same, then, then we may make a small adjustment. But um, that's about it on that. Um, otherwise, uh, the long-awaited retirement tool is technically uh, live in a beta. Um, so uh, I will post the link here um, in the office um, hours chat. Um, you're welcome to try it out. I have to say it's a beta. Um, so, you know, there are already a few minor bugs that have been reported. Um, for instance, after you do your approval, you'll need to refresh the page to get the button to change. Um, so we're already working on some fixes for those minor UX issues. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you have any feedback, um, please feel free to uh, to drop that into the um the feedback process in the in this Discord, and and we're going to try to get all those things worked out. But uh, yeah, it's a beta, so um, the whole idea here is to get user testing, get some uh, you know real stuff going through the tool, and uh, and then hopefully like next week, maybe early the following week, we'll have a production version that's all wired into the DAP, um, and hopefully we'll have worked out all of the uh, all the kinks by then. We're also um, just so people are aware, we're not going to be doing any marketing around the beta, because um, obviously it's still um, imperfect. So um, the the, uh, the marketing and PR push around the retirement tool will start once we have a production version ready. Um, so we are planning a campaign for that. It's a very, um, very cool idea um, that the marketing team came up with. Um, the, the idea is like love letters to the planet. Um, so we're building like a landing page that will show retirement messages from the UI, uh, from the retirement UI, and uh, we'll sort of give uh, some inspiration to people to offset their carbon emissions using Klima's retirement tool. Um, and then we'll feature a selection of those retirement messages um, as like love letters on the landing page. So very excited for that. I think there's a really um, strong possibility or, or like a, there's a, a, an integration here with like the social um, world, right? Where we can promote people's uh, climate positive actions in, uh, in in like more of a positive way rather than the traditional like you know making people feel bad for their carbon emissions we can turn this into a very positive thing where people are putting their money where their mouth is and, and doing something to to help uh, fight climate change yes it is indeed huge we're kind of underplaying it right now because it's a beta um, we've been working on this for a while but we wanted to get something out to the community even if it's not perfect um, so that you guys can start playing around and give us feedback um let's see what's next uh oh this is very exciting so uh we got listed on, crypt on crypto.com like overnight um like two days ago i think or something like that um they we didn't have anything to do with us this they just like launched a bunch of new polygon tokens on their exchange and we were one of them um chaz i don't know if you have that press release article thing they posted um but okay, real quick. thank you um, yeah, so basically we're listed on crypto.com. If you have a crypto.com account, you can purchase Klima there. Um, so uh, it's in the digital wallet section. I, I don't know exactly, honestly, I don't use crypto.com myself to understand like how their listings work internally, but basically we didn't do anything with them. They just decided to do this. And, um, you know, they, uh, yeah, so the DeFi wallet is the product it's listed under. Um, we're trying to figure out 
like basically it seems like you can only purchase the token you can't actually stake it because their wallet doesn't have polygon support so basically we, we're going to reach out to them and try to figure out a way to make it easy for people who have acquired klima through crypto.com to stake it with our dap um and less importantly get our logo updated <laughs> yes and also get our logo updated um yeah so that's very exciting we didn't have to do much there um but it will definitely bring more exposure and retail demand um for klima so very exciting um, let's see, um, so, uh, kind of in a similar vein around, um, like onboarding and, uh, acquisition of Klima tokens, um, we, we're working with two different fiat on-ramps right now. So we've got, uh, the mobile and partnership, which has been, um, has been kind of in the works for a while now, and it's finally bearing fruit. Um, they have a sort of preview that we was distributed to the internal team, uh, yesterday. So um, we gave them some design feedback. They're going to make a couple of quick fixes um, and hopefully we'll have the mobile um, integration ready to go into the website in like a few days, maybe early next week, something like that. Um, we're also working with Transac to get a fiat on ramp and they technically like Transac already supports Klima. Like they basically added it um, on their own site. Um, the only weird thing is you can only acquire it with non USD currencies. I don't know exactly why but you, you, i believe euros and pounds work but not us dollars so um sorry for the kind of ambiguous announcement but basically i'm a us um based so i i was only able to try with us dollars um but uh yeah so in theory you can acquire klima through transact using uh, a credit card as long as your credit card supports um non-us dollar currencies um so i think that's about it on like the onboarding side um Finally, we are very close to having a uh, carbon dashboard. So we're calling it the state of tokenized carbon. Um, the idea is that, uh, you know, one of the really cool things about operating on chain is that we have all this data um, about, you know, which tons have been bridged, the project IDs of each, you know, batch, um, as well as how many tons have been retired. Um, so we can provide a much greater level of transparency and detail to um, uh, like market participants not just the people who are buying and retiring the credits, but also like standards bodies um, who want to be able to monitor um, activity in the tokenized carbon market. Um, so we can provide much greater transparency and a uh, uh, really cool data that is really just not possible to get in the legacy market. So um, we've got a prototype of that. Um, uh oh, is my audio causing a problem? But anyway, uh, let me know if the, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we're, we're putting together uh, this dashboard that will basically show for each bridge, um, we're starting with Toucan and, and Moss, um, for each bridge it's going to show, you know, how many tons have been bridged, um, the breakdown of those tons across the different projects, um, and then, you know, how many tons have been retired and some other data about like vintage distribution and methodologies and stuff like that. So um, very cool stuff, not really possible to do in the legacy market. And um, we're going to hopefully have that ready for publishing sometime next week. Um, we've already started distributing it for feedback to a few people. Um, but uh, once it's looking a little better style-wise, I think we're going to be ready to, to get it out to you all. Cool. And those are all the high-level updates that I had on my list. Um, Archie, Chaz, you got any other alpha to leak? <laughs> I've been banned from doing so. I say yeah. I have alpha I want to leak. <laughs> um, I, I sorry, I only cut the last end of it, so I'm just reading in the chat to make sure I cut everything. Um, I think we've covered most of it. That's good. Cool. Um, we're at about 12 minutes past. I think we can open up the floor, and if anything else comes up, we'll we'll go back. Yeah, roll it, roll it. Hi, Seneca. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, is my microphone okay here? I hear you just fine. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm not sure how representative I am of the audience here, um, but maybe there's some people that listening that are in my position um, where I've been a supporter of the project and really optimistic about the project since it first started. I've been in it since like um, November or December um, and just... Uh, yeah, like keeping on putting stuff in since it started, um, just because I support the project and really value the mission, um, mission statement. Um, and so, um, 
my plan is to continue doing that just because I really have a good have a good uh experience with these office hours, you know, the ones I've attended, I've, I've got a good feel for the team and things like that. But I guess my question is, um, someone in my position, you know, who's kind of, you know, uh, maybe, a, you know, not a huge financial, um, you know, putting in a little bit every month, but also optimistic about the project, somewhat involved enough to know about the office hours and attend some, but not super knowledgeable about the crypto space um, as far as like the nitty gritty stuff. Um, as far as like looking forward to the future here, you know, over the next, you know, six months for a year, um, I'm just kind of, what would you kind of, is there something you would advise me to be either optimistic about in a certain regard? Like what direction, what, what things would you advise me to kind of uh, expect from the next six months? Um, things to feel good about, things that are kind of unknowns, and then um, just kind of like uh, anything else comes to your mind, kind of knowing uh, where I am in case anyone else is in the same position. Yeah. Um, so I guess I would break this down into two. I, I guess I break this down into two different sections. So like on one hand, there's um, there's like at the product level, like what are we building that is going to bring value to um, the Klima token, right? En enhance the utility of the Klima token and the refi ecosystem that we're trying to build. Um, so on that level, um, I really emphasize like the importance of mainstream adoption, um, not just among individual retail customers, but among institutions. So, cause that's really where the volume is going to come from. So, you know, where, where we are with Klima Infinity is we basically have a pipeline of organizations. Um, right now, you know, most of the organizations we've already onboarded are fairly um, forward leaning, right? They are leaning into crypto. They understand blockchain technology is the future, um, especially in the voluntary carbon market. They um, are most of the organizations we're working with, um, you know, they uh they see the benefits of operating on chain and they want to support us. Um, the, the next phase of expansion for KI is to start bringing um, institutions that maybe aren't already operating on chain or that need a custody solution, um, you know, in order to be able to operate on chain. We need to improve the um, onboarding process basically for, for larger institutions that are not as forward leaning on crypto. Um, so that's definitely something to look out for. We're working with a couple different custody partners right now. I don't have anything to announce because we don't have a like signed partnership with any of them, but um, that's kind of the big um, growth opportunity in the KI, like, you know, B2B model. Um, the other big thing that we are trying to work on in the next like six months to a year is a more self-service onboarding process. So like, if you are, you know, a mom and pop business or, you know, a small or medium enterprise and you would like to offset the footprint of your organization, we really want to create a like low friction um, sort of wizard experience, right? Where you show up, you put in some information about your organization, how many people you have, maybe what country you operate in, um, stuff like that. And then we help you um, estimate the amount of carbon you're going to need to um, to offset your emissions. Um, and then uh, provide sort of a step-by-step -step workflow where, you know, like we help you acquire whatever crypto you need, um, whether you need a custody solution or you can hold it self-custody. Um, and then obviously we have some tooling like the retirement tool that we just put up the beta of um, that will sort of give you like a one-click experience for doing that offsetting activity. Um, so that's sort of at the level of like adoption and um like basically the product level, right? Like we, we need to get our product out there, get people using it, make the user experience better. Um, the lower level is like around the protocol and like what's in, in store for the protocol itself for like the development of the treasury, expanding the treasury to new assets, stuff like that. Um, and at that level, I think the big, um, the big like, uh, the thing that we have sort of gestured at but not given a lot of detail on because it's still all being put in place is like basically we were going to bring most of the DeFi primitives from DeFi to refi, right? So like right now, basically all we have is like, you know, AMMs and some lending markets, right? Like uh, market XYZ and Cheetah have like lending markets where you can, you know, put your BCT in and, and borrow against it. Um, but there a lot of the other DeFi primitives uh, are not yet in place within refi. Um, 
So like there's been talk about, for instance, like stable coins where the collateral backing the stable coin is carbon. Um, I, I know there's a couple of projects that are working on that. Um, and so I think as these DeFi primitives come online, um, we can expect to see um, like much greater, for instance, much greater volumes in the transaction in terms of like transaction volume of on-chain carbon um, because there will be um, a rich ecosystem, much the same as there is in DeFi, right? Where, you know, you bring in capital and then you can do a lot of different things with that capital. Um, right now, the, the options for treating like carbon offsets as a capital asset that can be like um, utilized in different DeFi strategies is somewhat limited. Um, I realize I'm being a little vague, but I hope like the idea that like, you know, stable coins don't really exist backed by carbon. Um, there isn't really like a curve equivalent um, where you can do like high efficiency stable swaps between different kinds of carbon. Um, and, and so as those primitives come online, the possibilities for um, like utilization of Klima as that reserve asset, as a reserve currency for that refi, DeFi marketplace um, brings much greater adoption and utility to Klima than simply as like a basket of offsets, which is, I think, how it's viewed by most in the market right now. Did that make sense? Yeah, that was really helpful to hear. Um, it helps me kind of just understand kind of um, where the space is and, and the ideas moving forward. So thank you for answering that question. For sure. Thank you for asking. Um, let's see. don't have anybody else with their hand raised. If you'd like to come up on stage, please raise your hand. Otherwise, just checking up in the chat. Yeah, wizards. You're a wizard, Harry. Uh, NCO2 bond. Oh, yes. Actually, thank you so much for reminding me about this because I wanted to talk about that in the, in the top. So, um, NCO2 bonds are in a bit of a delicate, um, state right now. So basically what happened is, um, the treasury refuses to issue bonds that are unprofitable for the treasury. So in order to be profitable, basically, um, for, ev for every one Klima that the bonder is going to be issued, we need to bring in at least one ton of carbon, um, as, plus the fee, plus the DAO fee. So um, the DAO fee is set to 30% by default now as of a recent KIP. Um, but, you know, basically, so basically if the price uh, in Klima terms for the bond is below um, 1.3, then the bond will break, basically. The, the treasury will refuse to issue the bond, and that will result in an error from the user's perspective. So um, basically what that means is we, uh, like NCO2 bonds, as Klima was trading down at its lows, like around, you know, 10 to $11, um, the price of NCO2 was right around the price of Klima. And so the bond price went below that cutoff, um, and that breaks the bond. Now, the thing that we're trying to figure out, this is basically like a limitation of V1 um, Olympus bonds, just the way the contracts are written. They, they can't automatically recover from this situation. Uh, basically, once the bond price goes low enough, they'll never, the bond price will never go back up, even if the market price goes up. Um, or it has to go up a lot in order for the bond to re-enable itself. So um, we have a couple of options here. Basically, we have to do some multi-sig transactions to fix the MCO2 and Klima MCO2 bonds. It kind of takes a while. Um, so we basically just, uh, we marked them sold out for now, but they will come back. Um, it's just a matter of getting those bond contracts fixed. Um, the good news sort of long-term is that once we migrate to V2 bonds, this problem basically evaporates. They're, they're not, the internal logic is different, and so they don't have this, this issue. They will still fail to issue a bond. My understanding is they'll still fail to issue a bond if the bond price is too low, but they won't do this thing where they lock up, uh, where like they become unusable. So yeah, um, expect, I think, Archie, what do you think? Do you, you think we can get the MCO2 bonds fixed like this weekend? Maybe by Monday we'll have everything working again? Yeah, I could just go to PR. I just got to review it and then deploy it. And then there's always a 24 hour time lock. But yeah, we should, we should have a new version probably by Monday. Cool. Hope that helps. Um, I'll be honest, like this was a surprise to me. I, I don't know if like, because Olympus has not had this issue. Um, yeah, as far as I know. never seen it, right? So it was kind of something like buried in the contract that nobody was really thinking about until we got one of our bonds very close to the Klima price. <laughs> and it broke. <laughs> yep. I mean, well, honestly, it's also a it's hack. Good. <laughs> you could set, 
Yeah, you could set the fee to zero and then like increase the bond debt that way, but like that's not really a solution. We have like a full fledged new contract, and th- because there's no debt remaining in both those contracts, we can just redeploy a new ones, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, the good news for like Klima holders, I know it sucks for the bonders, um, but for the holders, it's good because the basically the treasury is smart. The treasury will not dilute itself below uh, like its, its minimum profitability. So um, yeah. it, it's a feature, really, not a bug, but it does result in a bug <laughs> for bonders. Treasury protect. <laughs> yes, exactly. Max protect. Oh, treasury, treasury, don't forget. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see. Do we have any other? Uh, I'm not sure about this offset tra- schlums. I'm not sure. Um. So they do both things. I spoke to offset about this. Like they were waiting for like the offsetting tool to be done. But yeah, they will. Like it's it's you could basically treat this as as Klima, but um, they will be. Like future stuff that's coming out of Ocetra is going to be moving towards the Klima offset uh, tool. Yeah, yeah, I know they're a KI partner, and we're going to be working with them to closer integrate like uh, their existing tooling with. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were saying um, that like well, most of their clients that do offsetting are going to come to use this tool once it's up and running. So awesome. Um, Ishmith got in a couple questions that got buried. Um, let me see. So the safe math issue, we were just talking about that. It's like basically a limitation of the contracts to, to protect the treasury. Um, we'll hope we'll have the, the short term issue resolved on Monday, but longer term going to Olympus V2 is the solution. Um, you had another question further back. Oh, yes. The, um, the NCT rebalancing. So I have some more information. Um, just to make it clear for everyone, we've been meeting with Toucan for the last like few weeks, basically, um, to formulate a strategy. So we put up an RFC on their governance forum, basically proposing a methodology for doing the uh, distribution of value um, from the NCT rebalancing event. So um, basically, we've been working closely with them. We've done some data analysis. They've done some data analysis. Um, and we're pretty close to having a finalized proposal for the community, um, basically on like the timing of the redis- of the distribution, as well as the amounts, um, the estimated amounts that are going to be distributed. So um, we'll put. I think the plan is for Toucan to post that on their governance forum, since it's really like a Toucan issue. Um, and then you know, all, obviously, every everyone here, you know, in the Klima community, as well as people from the Toucan community, can weigh in on that proposal. Um, and then, you know, assuming that there's sort of broad consensus that this makes sense, um, then we would move forward with that. I think they're planning, they're hoping to be able to move forward with that at some point next week for the um, for the first batch of value return. Um, beyond that, I don't want to say too much more because I don't want to like front run the information that they're going to be distributing. But um, the sort of long story short is that um, value will be returned. Um, it likely won't happen all at once. It will happen in chunks. Um, and, you know, Klima is set up to receive, of whatever value is returned, um, Klima is set up to receive about 80% um, back to the treasury. Um, since that was our share of the eligible tonnage that was bridged and held onto. Um, so 80% of the pie, um, the size of the pie is still sort of being worked out. Um, but whatever the size of that pie is, we will get about 80% of it. Did that, I hope that answered your question. Um, I, I know that um, it was kind of annoying because like Toucan, well, basically what happened is um, Toucan posted on our forum with an RFC uh, uh, suggesting to enable NCT bonding and that was rejected by the community, 51% no. Um, but in that RFC, they also made a, a statement about doing the value distribution by like March 13th, I think was the date they put in. And, and that date was kind of not, um, Super, or yeah, March 11th. That date wasn't really agreed upon by everybody, and I don't think maybe they realized like how long the analysis would take to like figure out who all the bridgers were and how much they held onto and stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I'm sorry about that confusion on the date, but basically we've been meeting with them for weeks now um, to get the data analysis um, in place. See you later, Archie. Um, but realistically, I don't think the 11th was ever like a reasonable timeline. Um, it's just 
something that was thrown out there in their original RFC. Sorry for that confusion. Um, so it says, oh, um, so yeah, we, the analysis is what we proposed on their forums. So basically by Bridger, um, you know, I can give a little bit of background on like why we at Klima, like the, the contributors agreed on um, analyzing by Bridger instead of by Holder. So, so there's sort of two big issues. Like on one hand, the bridging analysis is much more simple and straightforward because there's only like 20 addresses that bridged eligible tonnage. Um, so, you know, like we can literally go and check every transaction and make sure that we are confident that those bridgers held on to their funds through the rebalancing. Whereas with the holders, like if we were to do say, you know, everybody who held BCT, you know, for a month before the rebalancing event and had it still on the date of the rebalancing, um, we're talking about like a couple thousand addresses. So it would be not possible or at least not practical to do analysis, like check every address and make sure they held it. We'd have to use some kind of heuristic. Um, and the other thing to this is even if we were to analyze all those thousands of addresses, we know what the outcome would be, at least at, at broad strokes, because Klima held 85% of the total supply at that time. So from like Klima's perspective, it wouldn't make that big of a difference, but it would be a huge amount of extra work. Um, and then everybody else besides Klima are tiny holders. I mean, nobody has even, I don't even think anybody else has 1% of the total supply. So, um, you know, it, it, it wouldn't make much of a difference from a like broad strokes perspective, but it would be a huge amount of extra work. Um, so we, we thought the Bridger analysis uh, made more sense. Ultimately, like uh, my personal take here is like, I would like this to be behind us, you know? Um, I know a lot, a lot of people in the community are still upset about this, but like the reality is like Toucan owns the fact that like, they did not handle this well. You know, it was done in a rush because they were concerned about um, the market taking the arbitrage opportunity away. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I would encourage everyone to go into this, um, this uh, proposal that's being put, put forward with an open mind and try to think about like, how can Klima come out of this, um, you know, in the best position. And, and I don't think that like shitting on Toucan and like, you know, complaining about how they handled it at this point is like helpful. Um, so, you know, my two cents is like, read the proposal with an open mind, try to think of it from like, you know, how is Klima benefiting from this? And like, you know, is Toucan making a good faith effort to, um, to you know, make this right, even though they know that they didn't handle it correctly, at, you know, from the get go? Um, I think that's really the best outcome for all of us is to be able to move forward from this um, and restore that, that partnership, restore that trust. Thank you, Dunsey, for your um, magnanimity. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, the CO2 compact. Yeah, uh, actually, yes, there are a couple of basically like there's a lot of really cool ideas around how we can bake Klima and also carbon offsets in general into NCT or sorry, into NFTs. Uh, got NCT on the mind um, into the NFTs. So uh, like you know, Sven's artwork was like a one of one, um, you know, it was kind of a special thing we did for uh, um, uh, Ocean Drop, which is like an NFT charity event. Um, but the same idea could be turned into like a generic uh, like contract template where you basically build in some standard functionality into your NFT contract and then you send some, you know, WS Klima to it and then you'll be able to treat it like it will behave essentially the same way as that CO2 compound where it'll permanently hold the WS Klima and uh, essentially accrue more and more offsets as the Klima treasury grows. So um, I, I think that the dream there is really to make it easy for other NFT artists to embed this functionality into their contract rather than like Klima centrally being the one that is like putting out these NFTs. Um, yeah, hope that makes sense. Um, let's see, recent demand for Klima. Oh uh, yeah, so, um, I think we just put something up about MotorDAO like earlier today. I don't know if it's the full blog post or just a link. I think it's just a link to their um, press release. But um, yeah, we're definitely going to be partnering with MotorDAO more. Very cool what they're doing. Um, I think it also kind of sets a precedent for um, more niche um, DAOs, like DAOs that are not like necessarily DeFi related, but are more um, like social groups or um, other types of communities to um, leverage Klima for offsetting their real world activities and their on-chain activity too. Um, the other question, oh, so the recent demand for Klima, I mean, ah, oh, geez, I, it's hard to say. Um, my Now that I heard about the crypto.com listing, my hunch is that that is where a lot of the recent volume over the last couple of days has been coming from. Um, just because like, obviously they have to be providing 
um, you know, like basically they're bringing new audience to the market, right? They're making it easier for people who previously, you know, maybe didn't have the expertise to bring funds onto Polygon to be able to purchase with like their credit card. So um, I, I would expect that to be a major source of demand. Um, yeah, we were talking about it earlier, Duncy. They did it without without our like consent. They just kind of did it on their own um, on their DeFi wallet. So I guess it's not technically. Um, we talked about this earlier, but the short answer is no, they can't stake right now. But we're going to reach out to them and, and help them get their wallet connected to um, properly connected to Polygon so people can use it. Um, when Polygon, I can't comment on that right now. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing anything else. Oh, uh, Duncy, you asked about when we're going to remove more BCD USDC. Um, so we don't have any short term plan to do so, but I kind of view that pool as like basically deprecated. I mean, we're not going to be adding to it, but, uh, you know, we already have like 3 million in USDC just sitting around waiting to be used to bolster claim a USDC or for some other strategic purpose. So um, there's no need to pull more BCT USDC liquidity right now. Um, but the option is there and you know all we have to do is pass a kip to dissolve more of it we are talking internally within the policy team about establishing a more like um like a delegated function where we can say like okay you know policy knows that we need to bolster liquidity pools every once in a while and we you know we don't want to have to do a separate kip every time we want to bolster a liquidity pool so we might pass something that says like oh you know um we'll set aside like i don't know one million t clima and give the policy team the right to dissolve BCT USDC at will, um, but only in like limited chunks, right? So like we, we haven't come up with all the numbers on this, but you know, we set aside 1 million feet clima for this purpose. And then, you know, like no more than, I don't know, $2 million in USD value can be executed at once or something like that, some kind of guardrail. Um, so that way the policy team can take actions without having to go to a KIP every time, because it's going to get annoying if we have to do, you know, like four or five of these, over the course of the next few months um, just to like move funds around basically. So yeah, um, that should, that KIP is still being formulated, but I don't know, probably sometime around the beginning of April, maybe we'll be, we'll be talking about creating that delegated. Um, we're calling it a liquidity bolstering um, delegation or liquidity bolstering function. Um, let's see. Oh, so updates on other bridges. So C3 is getting ready to launch their um, is getting ready to launch their gauges soon. PM, um, I haven't gotten a firm date. I don't I don't know if they posted a firm date, but it's supposed to be sometime before the end of March. Um, they'll be launching their gauges, which means you'll be able to start staking um, and getting C3 rewards for any of your staked assets. So like I think the the gauges they're launching first are the liquidity gauges. So it'll be things like Klima USDC, Klima NBO, Klima UBO. Um, I think there's, oh yeah, and then C3 Frax, I think is gonna have one too for C3 liquidity itself. Um, so yeah, so we're not really planning to incentivize C3 liquidity at first. We're gonna rely on, uh, you're gonna let C3 basically rely on their incentives um, to attract liquidity for UBO and NBO, but um, we will be staking some of our assets, or at least we're planning to. Um, so we're gonna put up a KIP soon that will basically be requesting permission for us to, to stake some of the treasury's assets into the C3 staking contract. Um, you know, there's some security risk. Like we gotta make sure that the contracts are legit um, and that hopefully they've been audited. Um, what I'm pretty sure is going on is that they're basically forking um, the curve gauges is my understanding because it's a very similar system. Um, so, you know, the curve gauges are like some of the most trusted contracts in DeFi. They've been, you know, battle tested for years and audited multiple times. So um, as long as it's a straight fork of the curve gauges, I, I think we're feeling pretty good about their um, security. So, yeah, we'll put up a KIP at some point to give policy team the right to um, stake treasury assets in the C3 gauges. That's pretty much all the news I have on C3. Flow, I have not heard anything. My understanding is they're kind of stalled out right now, trying to get like approvals from the registries. I, I don't, I haven't heard anything, honestly, in the last uh, little while. Um, lots of, uh, oh, Belzerac, interesting question. So, um, it really depends on the partner. So some of them are actually offsetting their entire historical emissions. 
Some are thinking about things in terms of annual emissions and they'll like re-up um, as needed um, over the coming quarters or, or years. Um, but yeah, it, ba it basically, it varies from partner to partner. I don't think there is a, uh, I don't think there is a standard really around how long of a time commitment they're making. Yeah, I do not use crypto.com, so honestly, I'm, I really don't fully grok. I'm guessing it's like the distinction between the Coinbase sex and the Coinbase wallet, where like they have a like a wallet product you can use. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a big deal either way, because it's definitely bringing a lot more eyeballs um, onto Klima. Yeah, I think that's um, how many CO2 tons have been pledged. I don't have that information. Um, you know, I, I think because again, it, well, it's a good it's a good point. We should pull. We should have some some internal data on that around how much people are pledging. The real goal here, and I, I didn't mention this earlier, um, probably should have, um, is like a key a key feature of KI as a product is this notion of like a pledge, um, a pledge application, right? Where like as a KI participant, you go onto a, a, you know, an application where you put in your pledge um, and you, uh, you know, we, have, we pull the on-chain data basically for your address and we show like how much you pledged versus how much, you know, carbon you've actually acquired and how much you've actually retired. Um, so that sort of allows for a level of transparency that right now is totally non-existent. Um, like, you know, I don't know of any company that puts up their um, like Vera, you know, account numbers and says like, here, go look in the registry for our individual retirement events. Usually it's some PDF that they distribute, like a 50 page PDF with like all their, you know, detailed methodology from a consulting firm they hired. And then buried somewhere in that PDF is like a description of, you know, which particular project they retired. Um, so we're really trying to bring that transparency that's currently missing from the market so that as a company or as an organization, um, you can present to your um, investors, you can present to your consumers and the public um, a like verifiable on-chain pledge that will show um, exactly how much you've actually retired and sort of hold you accountable over time to your pledge. Yeah, but I definitely will, I will follow up with the KI team and see if we can pull some numbers on how much uh, tonnage has been pledged so far. Yeah, so, you know, um, it's an interesting point about, uh, so I'm just trying to read what you wrote, Dunsey, about the BCT USDC login. Yeah, it's a little more complicated than that, actually, because in theory, like, you know, if BCT price, um, if BCT price rises, then yeah, you're right. We would end up with less BCT uh, in the treasury um, because like when we eventually dissolve the, the liquidity. Um, the flip side though is like if BCT price were to go down and then we dissolve, we get more BCT. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a wash right now. I think the real issue is, um, you know, like we basically by removing the BCT from the liquidity and putting it into the treasury naked, um, then we would get greater runway, right? Like that, those assets would be fully marked up, like they wouldn't be marked down the way the liquidity is. So um, we'd have more um, more BCT reserves. But um, I guess we don't feel a lot of pressure on this because honestly, like we, you know, Klima USDC is already the dominant pool. Um, you know, BCT USDC is pretty underutilized. But you know, like just yanking all of it, we would just be left with a bunch of USDC basically. And we have to decide what to do with it. And we already have like 3 million in USDC we're trying to decide what to do with. So, um, you know, I, I, it is a good problem. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is we're not in any particular rush to dissolve BCT USDC, but we are definitely planning to dissolve the rest of it over time. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I ha we haven't talked about this um, idea, Anonf, of um, like a top level dashboard for KI that shows all the pledges aggregated, I, but that's definitely something we can um, we can build. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know what else to say. It's a, it's a great idea.
<laughs> um, I use organic whole wheat flour to feed my sourdough starter, and basically no matter what I make, it seems to turn out great. For more locking. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. Duncey about... Yeah, I got to think about that one more. Your point being that, like, when people are bonding BCC, they're buying it out of the pool. Um, you know, I, I think right now, because the BCT USDC pool is larger, they're, uh, you know, unless they're specifically buying with FEMA, they are probably getting routed through the BCT USDC pool for their BCT purchases. Um, yes, my sourdough recipe is redacted, definitely. Spoiler alert. Um, so, uh, yeah, I got to think about that one more, Duncey. But I, I guess no one on the policy team has gotten the feeling that, like, oh, no, like, we need to dissolve. Yeah, exactly. let's talk about this in policy. Um, I, I could see – I can see arguments on both sides. I haven't been convinced that there's an urgent need to dissolve the, the LP. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, you can definitely be – I think you're already a sprout over in the contrib server. But yeah, I mean, that is that is definitely what we envision the Sprouts program to be for, right, is to like give the community an opportunity to be involved in the like DAO contributor discussions without um, like asking you to do work for free. Because I think that's something we're, you know, we're very hesitant to like put expectations on people that they do work without getting compensated. So, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, I. Like, I don't want people to feel like we are gating the um, admission to the DAO, um, to the DAO server, but what we're really trying to do is to keep the work focused, right? Because, like, there's a lot to be done, and, um, and you know, having, uh, like, everyone who wants to be able to participate in the internal discussions able to just, like, jump in there would definitely create a lot of distraction and make it very hard to manage. So, um yeah, I hope you guys understand, but the whole point of the Sprouts program is to try to create that, um, like, kind of gateway or, or like, a, a portal where, as a, as a non-contributor, you know, just a community member, you can still, like, be involved in the contributor discussions and, and talk about the work um, in a level that, like, most of the time in the public discord, in this discord, we don't really get down to brass tacks, um, except maybe in the policy forum. Yeah, as the expression goes, you can have too many cooks in the kitchen. Exactly. Yeah, and that's really the concern with the DAO working server. Um, yeah, the Solidity Learning Group, Shimon has been doing a great job managing that. Um, we, uh, I think we have about 10 to 15 people attending on a weekly basis, so it's, uh, it's pretty good um, creating that pipeline for new Solidity developers to get their feet wet. Um, could you share some thoughts on how price action would improve the runway? Um, well, so this has more to do with like bonding than anything, like because ultimately runway is dictated by two factors. There's the rate at which rewards are paid out, which is like the reward rate. Um, and then there's the rate at which revenue comes in. Um, so the idea is that if the premium on Klima is higher, meaning like the difference in price between the Klima token itself and the bondable assets that are bonded. Um, the higher that premium is, the greater capacity we can we can support basically, um, because we we'll basically we get more um, of the bonded assets per Klima issued with a higher premium. So basically, the higher Klima's premium is, the more we're bringing in um, per bonded Klima. Um, yeah, so basically, if, you know, all else being equal, right, like bond capacity being the same, reward rate being the same, percent state Klima being the same, if we just had an increase in Klima's premium um, over the bondable assets, um, that would increase the rate at which the runway is extending, um, or at least, like, it would, yeah, it would turn the curve up on the runway, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, BCT is the most profitable bond we have. That's true for the Treasury, yeah. Um, because the premium is the highest. Yeah, exactly. Now it's tough because we want higher quality tons, right? We want to diversify the treasury. Um, but there's this sort of, there's this tension between um, quality and quantity within the carbon market, right? So obviously if you've got a higher quality ton, like a nature-based project, um, that is going to fetch a higher price. 
so we can get less of them for the same amount of capital. So it's a balance. We want both. Ultimately, we want both, you know, low cost, high volume, and we want higher quality, lower volume tonnage in the treasury. Um, Clean up price on the website. This is definitely something we can do. I don't, um, I don't know exactly where the best place to put it would be. I guess you know we're going to have Mobileum and Transac integrated at some point. So I think once we have like a an area where you can acquire Klima, then having a Klima price chart would make sense. Um, yeah. So the rebase time change. Uh, um, this is tied up with what I was talking about earlier about the APY changing slightly from our target of 1,000%. Um, and the reason is basically, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Sirthus, we will only show recent price action. Um, the, the reason for that change in uh, APY over the last few days especially um, is twofold. So there's a change in um, the percent of Klima staked, which goes into the, um, the APY. Um, so we've gone from about 85% of Klima to about 87% of Klima being staked, which will um, affect the, the APY. And then the other thing is that the block times on Polygon have been slightly shorter. They've been like, um, uh, like the block times have been like 6.9 seconds recently instead of 7.2, which is the number we used when we computed the 1,000%. So, um, you know, multiple factors at play, but basically if we continue to sit at this, you know, 888 percent, which is outside the 10 percent deviation allowed by KIP 9, um, the policy team can step in and do a, a minor adjustment to bring us back in line with that with that target. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So like a longer block time means you're going to have fewer rebases per day, which will then compound out to a lower APY. Um, so actually, yeah, now that I think about it, actually, the shorter block times are actually working against the higher percent staked. So it's really the higher percent staked that is the main driver of this uh, lowering of the APY. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think Polygon's a bit of a victim of their own success here. Um, you know, they've achieved something that I think, um, you know, basically the scale and adoption that they've seen is far superior to any other L2 that I'm aware of. Um, so like they'll, yeah, as, as I buy said, like they'll be fine. They're a big company. They've got lots of products. It's not just about Polygon POS, which is what we use. Um, but there's actually multiple blockchains within the Polygon ecosystem. It's really cool. I, I don't know if you guys have had time to dig into like the broader Polygon ecosystem, but like they're building private blockchains for enterprises. They're building like self-service blockchains. They've got a ZK um, roll-up sidechain that they're working on. So it's very cool what they're building. I think the hard part for, for them is that they're trying to maintain this gigantic um, POS chain, the, the Polygon public chain that we all use while building out all these other products. And, and honestly, it's hard for any organization to support something at the scale of the Polygon POS network. So um, yeah, a bit of a victim of their own success. I, I think they'll work out the issues, but um, you know, it's kind of an issue that all blockchains face ultimately, right? Like block space is limited by the constraints of the network. So like as demand increases, or if there are issues with like the, um, the, like the implementation under the hood of how the blockchain works, that will limit the performance of the blockchain. Um, you know, one of the trade-offs that Polygon made when they designed their POS chain is that they, uh, you know, they're sort of pseudo decentralized where like the actual operation of the network is decentralized in that there are many, many validators. Not, they're not all run by Polygon, but the list of validators is centrally managed. Um, so there's this sort of tension that they have where, you know, when something goes wrong, um, it can be somewhat convoluted to actually solve it. Um, so like we had this issue a couple of weeks ago where uh, basically the blockchain got out of sync, essentially. The, um, the two layers of the chain, the Bohr and Heimdall chains, um, were no longer making progress at the same rate. So they had to release a hotfix. Um, you know, it's definitely not a good look when you have to release a hotfix and your network is down for 12 hours. But at the same time, given how long Polygon has been around and the transaction volume that they're handling, um, I think honestly, it, they recovered from it pretty well, I would say. Yeah, I just shared a link in the office hours chat. If you scroll to the bottom, there's actually, fun fact, there's actually four different teams working on ZK rollups inside of uh, Polygon. 
And then there's a couple others that are working on like the uh, data availability side of it to then be able to have data go across to each one of those rollups over time. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I view Polygon as like, most people think of Polygon as POS because that's what we all use as the public, but their real value add is that they're building like a like developer ecosystem for blockchains. Um, so that no matter whether you're working in an enterprise or you're working, you know, on a public chain, you know, they provide uh, the appropriate tooling for um, for each use case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't exactly put Polygon on par with Ethereum. One of the cool things that I appreciate a lot about the Polygon ecosystem is that they are very committed to Ethereum at the base layer. Um, they do not want to be running their own, like, um, you know, proof of stake chain that holds ultimate authority. The proof of stake chain that we all use actually defers authority to the uh, to the Ethereum L1 blockchain um, through checkpoints. So, um, yeah, I, I personally feel fine about Polygon. Um, I've operated large scale production systems in my past experience as a DevOps engineer, and like it is not easy when the systems are decentralized. It's even harder. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they're all pretty professional over there. I, I don't have any long term concerns. Yeah, the way I like to phrase it is uh, they're tackling scaling from all angles, and they're still very closely aligned with the Ethereum blockchain. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah, there is like a tipping point announced where um, basically the like rate at which uh, revenue is coming in, tonnage is coming in through bonds, balances out with the rate at which um, we're paying out rewards. Um, it's kind of hard to calculate, honestly, because bond revenue is not super predictable. Um, it's basically dictated by like how high of a discount the bonders need before they're willing to bond. So um, it's hard to forecast, basically. But there is a tipping point, like a golden ratio, as you say, um, where the the inflows and outflows would balance. Um, you know, long term, what will ultimately happen is that the revenues will eventually exceed the rate at which we're paying out rewards as we lower the reward rate toward maturity. Um, but we need to grow the supply quite substantially before we reach that point. Um, but yeah, it, the idea is eventually, you know, the treasury becomes uh, like a uh, inflow versus outflow balance, right? And the, the price of Klima will be driven by um, the relative demand for carbon offsets versus the relative, de the relative demand for carbon offsets now versus the demand for carbon offsets in the future. Um, and this is where that whole idea of like a yield curve comes up that Brian has talked about in the policy chats. Um, so like with with uh, with inverse bonds for WS Klima, what you would basically be doing is, um, you know, you'd be locking up your WS Klima for some period of time, like, say, six weeks or, you know, three months or whatever. And then um, there's some there's some discount you get for locking it up. Uh, and that discount will have a curve, will have a yield curve where, like, basically the shorter, you know, you know, typically you'd expect that the longer you lock it up, the more of a discount you should get. But if everyone is thinking the same thing and they're all locking it up for the maximum amount of time, that will drive that discount down. Um, so there's this sort of dynamic where um, basically a market is created through time for Klima, um, which is very similar to how like the Federal Reserve manages dollars, where there's a dollar market through time. And that's called the, the treasury yield curve. Um, and it's a very important indicator for macroeconomic conditions. So the idea of creating something similar, um, a yield curve for tokenized carbon is very exciting and would give the policy team a lot more information about the market and like how much demand there is for carbon offsets at different timescales. Um, Bitmo. Yeah. Um, I didn't see that. I haven't, I didn't see that they did another, I knew they did a grant of like two rounds ago. I thought they did a grant, but or I guess it was last round, round 12. Um, yeah, wait, this is the round 12 grant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh no, they did another one. Sorry. Um, I haven't heard anything more about Bitmo. The last thing I heard is that they are still trying to find a, uh, an, uh, country. Um, a nation that is willing to be the first to tokenize their ITMOs. Um, obviously, that's a big risk for the first mover because there's risk of that their ITMOs will, you know, fail or like not be demanded. No one will be willing to buy them. 
But um, yeah, we're as far as I know, they're basically still looking for that first mover who's willing to uh, to tokenize their ATMOs. Just to catch everyone up, I realize we ta started talking about Bitmo without saying what ITMOs are, but basically, um, you know, th they're a, a form of compliance credit that can be traded between nation states. Uh, right now, all those trades are done like over the counter, basically, like the nation states have to directly um, directly interface with each other in the legacy world. But the idea with Bitmo is to bring those um, those allowances, those mandatory um, compliance credits, to bring those on chain and allow them to be traded um, as NFTs. Um, so in theory, you know, those those Bitmo tokenized ITMOs can be stored in the treasury um, and treated as you know carbon offset backing. But uh, yeah, obviously they have to be brought on chain before we can bring them in the treasury. So that's still a, a bit of a ways off. I don't know if they're talking to Ecuador, but that does sound like it would be a, um, you know, it sounds like a, of all the countries I can think of, they're definitely very forward thinking on blockchain or at least trying to be. A, my understanding is that there's some concerns about the use of Bitcoin as their, um, their currency, but it is very exciting. Um, so ITMOs are part of a, part of the Paris Agreement framework for international trading of allowances. Um, I, my understanding is that they are distinct from like the ETS cap and trade system, um, but I think they might be able to be folded in. Like I think you can turn ETS credits into ITMOs. I, honestly, I'm not an expert on ITMOs, so I'm going to have to defer to uh, the other carbon market experts. Maybe we can talk about that in the Carbon Markets channel, Masanobu. Yeah, you know, I think with the hand raising thing, in fact, you know, I realize we're just about at time. Um, it is hard. You know, I think we can answer a lot more questions when we're doing it in text, but we don't get that same level of engagement. So, um, yeah, I think why don't we uh, why don't we get one more person up here for a question, and then we can uh, we can wrap things up. Hey, Marvin. Hey, how are you? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Wow. I was not expecting uh, to get called on. I'm so flattered. Um, so I was, I was wondering, uh, the last time that, that I was in one of these calls or the, or a few times ago, I remember, I think that was towards the end of the bull run. And I think that there was a lot of, mm, you know, there was like just a lot of hype in crypto at that time. And now unfortunately the, like the momentum was taken away, but, um, kind of just in this more bearish market, how are we going to add more, more carbon credits to the, uh, to the treasury rather than uh, burning like claims to the treasury. That's really more what I'm, what I'm interested in. Like if Klima has made any strategic alliances with reputable carbon credit issuers so that there can be mm, some facilitation of, of uh, carbon credit generation through you know, like, like, uh, Klima could, could start planting, strategically planting, uh, trees to sequester carbon, for example, and maybe fruit bearing trees because then that, that, uh, sequesters carbon, uh, cyclically. You know, it's just things like this. There's, there's some, uh, methods that can be employed to, consistently generate year over year. And I think that's what's more important, having a reliable source of uh, carbon credits. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. So I want to reframe your question slightly just to like make it more clear sure. Sure. what you're talking about. Um, so you're basically proposing like, why doesn't Klima invest directly in carbon offset projects, projects that are creating carbon offsets, so that we would then have like a sort of um, like a perennial source of offsets flowing into the treasury at like yeah. some fixed cost, right? Like some just based on the investment we made. Um, I think like well, one thing is um, that process of going from like 
project idea to like Vera offsets issued and bridged, that's right now like a 18 month to three year process, um, which fucking sucks, honestly. Um, but that's just the status quo within the legacy offset world. So I think really where I see the opportunity for Klima in the direct investment phase is not so much investing in offsets, like in specific offset projects, but rather partnering with um, protocols or platforms that allow individuals to like aggregate their offset activities. Let me be more precise. Mm-hmm. So like, um, you know, r- right now, um, in order to get a Vera offset issued, you basically have to have like an auditor flown out and, you know, financial statements have to be drawn up and a whole bunch of accounting has to take place to make sure that everything's being done above board. Um, but there are some really exciting new projects that are basically proposing new methodologies to Vera that don't exist right now that would utilize more advanced technology for um, verifying the offsets. So instead of having to send out an auditor, you could do something like collect IoT data from devices that measure the actual carbon sequestered or the actual carbon um, mitigated, like the uh, emissions avoided. Um, So that to me is the path forward on this. It's not like Klima going and buying a forestry company and like having them do afforestation on our behalf or something. I I just don't think it's a super effective use of capital. because of the, the long turnaround time and the fact that it doesn't really scale, like once that forestry project is over, we're going to have to invest more um, to get more offsets. Whereas the idea of like a platform that makes the issuance of small scale offsets through a, a reputable registry like Vera is much more attractive from like a cost benefit ratio perspective. Um, I hope that makes right. sense. Right. So, so then just, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, I was saying more, I was asking more if strategic partnerships have been, uh, have been like forged. I know you said what the status quo is, but, uh, if you have, you know, basically, basically I'm hearing just no, there haven't been further, uh, relationships forged that well, would, yeah. What, what I will say is we are in several partnership talks with various projects trying to do something like this. Um, just to give mm-hmm. like, uh, I'm not, I don't want to name names because I don't want to ruin any partnership discussions, but like sure, one of the sure. potential partners we're talking to basically is, is tokenizing tree planting. Um, so like, you know, they plant a tree and then each token represents one tree that they planted. Um, but the problem is that's not offsets, right? It's kind of like an offset future or something like that, where like in the future, maybe once they get the project verified, then eventually you'd be able to turn some number of trees that you that are, that were planted like redeem those tree tokens for like actual offsets. Um, but that's going to take several years to play out. So I, I think we're open to the idea of including something like offset futures in the treasury, but we need to time it right, and we need to make sure we pick the right partner to do it because the last thing we want is to you know is to partner with somebody and we end up with you know a hundred thousand dollars worth of trees in our treasury. And then it turns out that they, you know, their methodology isn't acceptable to Vera and they get zero offsets issued. Um, so, you know, right. I just don't think we're in a position to make those kinds of bets right now because we're still so early. So, yeah. So, so then just in response to that, then um, I think a much more like competitive uh, way of approaching it would say that would be that, partners who meet the standard then then will uh you know receive payment or something like that but if they don't meet vera standards then obviously they're not going to uh they're not going to be and you don't need to add the futures you know you don't need to you don't need to uh value the future uh carbon credit to be awarded one to one now i don't think that i think that that's like an unnecessary derivatives play at this yeah, point. I think it's, you know, like, like that should just be priced in by the market. And then it's just like, hopefully it won't get too high. Uh, and like, yeah, kind of just act as liquidity exit for, for people who've been playing the long game, you know? Yeah, totally. And this is, yeah, I guess that's where it's like, we're right now operating on the very low risk end of the risk curve, if that makes sense. We're basically providing yeah. liquidity and holding carbon. Um, but I think as we mature and especially as the size of the treasury grows to a point where like we can comfortably pay rewards and have a long runway that we're like not concerned about, um, being degraded 
by like lack of premium or too high of a reward rate, I think we'll be much better positioned to go out on the risk curve. The other thing I want right. to bring up, because it was kind of another way of interpreting your question, is um, sure. like new sources of existing tons, right? Like tons that have already been issued but aren't on chain yet. Um, and that to me is where like the the development of additional bridges is very exciting here, um, because uh, you know like ultimately, um, how do I put this? Right now, the primary driver of demand for on chain credits is Klima bonding. Right. Um, because there aren't that many consumers yet on chain consuming the credits, like buying them to use them. So, mm -hmm. you know, basically what we really need to achieve the scale of adoption that will like position Klima for long term success is we need more uh, of the traditional market to come on chain. We need consumers who typically go through a, like a broker to start buying and consuming their offsets on chain. And that's where like C3's partnership with Aether is really very exciting and I think cannot be understated because Aether is the largest broker in Europe. They have, you know, over a billion dollars in annual revenue. So there's a ton of tons, pardon the pun, um, coming right. through Aether already. It's just that right now they're all being retired and purchased off chain. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think the fact that they partnered with C3 is pretty indicative of like where Aether thinks this market is going. Um, so, you know, as that volume comes on chain, um, the um, the total uh, supply of carbon offsets that Klima can absorb into our treasury will grow substantially. Whereas we kind of uh, leveled off with Toucan at the current prices, like there just isn't enough demand um, for on-chain carbon to support arbitrage of tons on-chain. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think Aether's partnership with C3 just positions C3 to be a source of much larger um, legacy demand uh compared to like where we are um right now does that make sense yeah it definitely does it's my concern for uh carbon credit acquisition comes more from a desire to have the uh the currency pegged one to one at least in like at the very least one to one and an alliance with that organization is great, but that effectively means you have permission to buy from uh, from their market, I think. So it's it's also good to hedge against that and secure the you know the treasury by having more like proprietary sources. Let's if we want to call it that way. Um, but this, this is just my, these, these are just some things I've been thinking about for a while. I've been looking into it myself and, you know, it's just, it just what I think because I want to make sure that the protocol is safe. Totally. You know, so I and like think about these things. I mean, I'll just be real. Like there is a lot of trust in the carbon markets in general because like Vera, for instance, is a trusted third party that is essential right now to all of our tons whether it's from Toucan or Moss or C3, they're all bridging Vera tonnage. So there's definitely, in the, in the current carbon markets, it's just hard to escape the fact that there is a trusted entity, um, which is the registry. And uh, yeah, so I, I hear you. And I, I think this is basically why we want to diversify the treasury because, you know, any one bridge is potentially a risk, but, um, you know, Klima being like a credibly neutral market facilitator, we can diversify that risk. Um, yeah, I appreciate your concerns. And, and I'm happy to talk about this some more. Um, I think carbon markets would be the appropriate place to talk about like offset generation through like, you know, partnerships or something like that. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah. Yeah, it just, you got a cool, you got a cool name though, you know? So like mm -hmm. people might get clout by working with you. So it's like also there's this factor as well. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, that's why like we're, you know, we are not going to be entering and basically we will not accept any treasury for any uh, asset for bonding into the treasury without a KIP. Um, you know, we passed KIP 17 to allow non-dilutive revenue from, you know, basically we'll be doing due diligence on each carbon ton that we add to the, the aggregator, but we're not going to be passing a KIP for each one. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right that there is counterparty risk in any um, in any tokenized carbon asset because of the fact that they have to be bridged um, through some kind of trusted entity. 
Um, but yeah, all we can really do is diversify to, to mitigate that risk. Great. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I think with that, we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you all for coming. Hope this was helpful. Uh, join us again next week. See you later. See you.